Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's another another opportunity to be with you guys and talk uh, slightly different, slightly different this time. We're going to talk about the Center for Conflict Resolution. Um, the center is doing great work here. Uh, they've supported a lot of the work we've done here at the CARES Learning Partnership, partnership with the Mentorship Institute, a lot of stuff we've done in schools and in churches, just really helping people to get along better. Um, helping people to resolve conflicts within themselves, within their congregation, within their community. Uh, and so I am just over, overjoyed to have uh, Richard, JR, and Tony uh, the, the, to, be with, to be with you guys today and really just take a moment and just go down history lane on, on how we got to where we're at. So thank you so much for being here, and we'll get right into it. Um, I guess the best place to start would be what prompted, and, and anyone can, can go around, we'll go around, we'll do a round robin on this one. What prompted your interest in conflict resolution? Because all of you are multi-talented. This is not the only thing you do. You do several different things, and I'll let you share some of that a little later. But for conflict resolution, uh, Richard, let's start with you. What, what prompted your interest in conflict resolution? Well, in law school, I took a class in alternative dispute resolution, and when I told a, uh, an attorney I knew how excited I was about it, he, he almost yelled at me and told me it was stupid and it didn't matter and it didn't work. And then uh, I got into my law practice and I hadn't thought about it a whole lot, but I had two clients that I'd done work for that I really liked a lot, and they were in a, a lawsuit against each other. And one side, I think, had spent $50,000 in, in one year of fighting. Another one had spent $75,000 in a year of fighting with the other. And uh, one day, I happened to see the attorney representing one of the parties. And I said, you know, I, I like both of these parties so much. And I, I've thought about offering myself as a mediator. But I really hate to get in the middle of this. Well, a few hours later, that attorney calls me and says, my client wants you to mediate. And uh, so I said, okay, well, I'll call the other side. And I called the other side. They instantly said yes. So we set up a date to get them together. They came to my office. I'm just uh, tied up on a phone call. And I come out to my little waiting room. And there's nobody there. And I asked my secretary, where are they? And she says, oh, I put them both in the conference room. And I said, you put them both in there? And I just thought, oh, no. What am I walking into? And I opened the door. And I walk in. And the first, they, they almost said it in unison. We don't need you. Wow. They had already worked out a resolution. Now, they ended up needing me for about another six months to get all the technicalities for a settlement agreement done. But the fact is that just getting them together and communicating as opposed to going through their attorneys and, and being tied up with you know, litigation law in motion. And that was my, my uh, uh, turning point. I had listened to that lawyer tell me it was stupid. And then I uh, had this experience and I realized it's not stupid. This is real. This really can work. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I, I uh, sought out mediation and became a mediator for the local court. Wonderful. Wonderful. Tony, what about you? You know, uh, similar. I, I went to law school in Chicago in the early 70s. And I learned from my teachers that justice is when you win. And I took that to heart. I believe that. And it was like, there's got to be a winner and there's got to be a loser. Hmm. And I was involved in the political scene of the Daily Machine, and I worked at the Chicago Park District. And this is going to be a quick story, but this was my epiphany. I was a law clerk, but I got involved in a lot of federal litigation. And one time, these floating docks were installed by a little mom and pop business out of Michigan in Chicago Harbors. And then a freak spring storm came and they ripped them out. It would have cost about $7,000 to go and collect all those floating docks and bring them back. But the my boss, the general counsel for the park district said, prepare a complaint. So I wrote up a complaint. It was like six years we were in litigation over that. Who was right and who was wrong? The contract was about two inches thick because it was a you know governmental contract, and the clause that talked about act of God you know force uh, du, du jour uh, uh, you know the storm was so confusing. I would read it one day and I say, oh man, you know we're going to win this, and the next day I'd read it and say, hey, we're going to lose this. So who knew? That's why it took so long. It was confusing. I think I went through two different judges, but the point was, Cliff. 
I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way. I so, so I then I moved back to Kentucky and I got a job with the VA and I became their district counsel, a chief attorney. And that's when I started to explore mediation much like Richard, but I was in a position to make it happen. So we did a lot of mediations of uh, contract work, uh, EEO claims within the workplace uh, mediations. And uh, back in 1991, I think I was involved in the federal uh, share of the uh, federal executive association and we formed a little group and we trained about 40 people to be mediators within the federal agencies and the post office was a part of that that training and so they started doing their mediations in 1995 and they've done hundreds of thousands so i think it's born uh it's born out it's 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 shown its value anyway that's a long story to say I came across, across it honestly and looking for a better path because I just knew justice is not when I win because it's not when I lose either. Correct, correct. No, I appreciate the story. Stories are impactful. Uh, so sometimes we try and give too much information and sometimes you get it all from just a story. So I appreciate that. JR, what about you? If I, um, when I was coming out of public broadcasting, um, I was creating, decided that education was all going to go online, you know, that that was going to be a big part of, of education going forward. And so I put together a, a, a company with a couple of, of partners to, um, to work with schools and people all over the, we ended up working with 120 universities around the world, training their faculty how to do them online and providing services to them. In the midst of that, this would have been about 1998. Um, a friend of mine who I, I knew who was, had been the corporate counsel for G General Electric Appliances was actually a, a, a mediator and was training mediators. And he called me and he said, hey, I know you're doing all this online stuff. Um, is there any way that I could maybe do some of my mediation training online? And I said, I don't know. I, you know, tell me about it. So he said, well, I got a class starting next week. So why don't you just come and be part of the class? So I went through his class and got certified as a mediator and fell in love with the process. You know, found that there was, there was the first thing I'd, I'd ever seen that, that provided an opportunity for the parties involved to, to resolve something based on really on their interests and their needs, not just what they thought they wanted. <clears throat> and so I, I was intrigued by it. Didn't <clears throat> practice mediation at all, just went on to do the rest of my stuff. And then lo and behold, one of my clients brought me on board, um, Sullivan University, brought me on board um, as a, a senior vice president for them to help build their online. And I was still running my company, but they paid the company for me to be with them. And when I was there, I was there for a couple of weeks and they said, we have this person we need you to meet. And the person they wanted me to meet was Tony Bielak. And um, Tony and I became instant friends and probably a half an hour into our conversation, Tony told me about what he was doing in mediation. And I said, well, you know, I've been trained, but I don't do much there. Um, and he said, well, I have this, this, this law firm that needs me to train their people, but they can't take the time out of work. Plus the Federal Mediation Conciliation Services needs to do this. And their, their attorneys can't take the time to come into the 40 hour face-to-face -face training. I don't really know what to do. And I said, since I had already, spent time trying to figure out how to do this before, which we never did. Um, my, my friend moved on before I, I, I actually built it for him. Tony, you know, I told Tony and Tony said, okay, let's do it. So we began doing that. And then I began training with Tony um, and we began teaching together. And um, I ended up going back to the university and doing my doctorate in alternative to spoof resolution because I get so involved and, and cared so much about it. So. Wow, wow. Um, you know, as an educator, I always uh, try and get my students to recognize, uh, don't fret if you don't have it all figured out. <laughs> because when you meet people, you know, you go in different direct, what am I gonna do? Who am I gonna be? How about you just follow your passion, look for opportunities because sometimes it takes you in circles for a little bit, and then you bump into somebody, and you go forward, you go back. It's all a part of life. That is that is excellent. So you guys well, have been together for a while. 
Um, and that's that's good. So, Richard, talk to me about um, how did this team become involved with the Center of Conflict Resolution? You know, it's, a, again, an act of God. And uh, we are here by the grace of God and uh, work that he's done through the VersaCare Foundation. The VersaCare Foundation president at the time uh, was a guy named Robert Coy, who uh, was, he had a title, something like Chief Deputy Counsel. He was the senior lawyer for all lawyers in the Veterans Administration. And he was Seventh-day Adventist, and he um, uh, had seen what could be done with alternative dispute resolution, and in particular mediation, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Tony. And he was aware that Tony had created the first um, accredited online master's degree in conflict resolution at Sullivan University. Wow. And so one day, uh, Bob Coy, uh, Ron Wisby, former president of uh, the Columbia Union, and uh, and Vice President of VersCare and I, as General Counsel of VersCare, were having uh, a meal together, and uh, none of us knew that the other had an, a, a deep, abiding interest in conflict resolution. Hmm. And it came out in that conversation, and out of that conversation, VersCare decided that it was going to try to um, bring conflict resolution into the mainstream of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Subsequent to that, we discovered the, the uh, Adventist, the Seventh-day Adventist call for peace in 2002 that nobody's ever heard of, where the executive committee of the General Conference called out to the entire world church and said, world church, the Adventist church is going to be um, uh, commissioned as a peacemaking church. And it's a beautiful statement. It's available on the uh, General Conference and the North American Division website. But it's a call to peace, it's a call to pastors, and it's a call to Seventh-day Adventist rank and file to become engaged in the peacemaking process. And so the Center for Conflict Resolution was created to carry out that call for peace and make it a reality for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wow, that's excellent. Um, so we're, we're talking about con conflict resolution. Tony, I'll, I'll give you this question. Since it's very rare that you have, I'll just... Richard, you mentioned this in passing, but because it's very rare that you interview creators. And you said Tony created the first, and that word, you know, you you talk to practitioners a lot, but it's very rare that you actually get to talk to a creator. So Tony, uh, since you're the creator, um, I, I'll, I'll put this question to you. Um, what can conflict resolution uh, do for me as an individual? So I've heard this. I'm I'm not I'm not a I'm not leading an organization. I'm not in the justice system. I'm I'm just a person that knows that conflict is a part of life. Um, as an individual, what what could I do with this type of I don't know tool or skill? Is there any value, or is it only for the the experts? Oh man, it'll change your life. Everybody needs it. Cliff, little correction. I am not a creator. I'm just an opportunist. The, cre the creator is Richard and JR. Because when JR told me about the let's put the training online, he said, I said, yeah, but not until after. I said, no, nah, you can't do that. <laughs> and he convinced me, the hell, yes, you can. And, and yes, you can. And it's a wonderful class. And in that training material, and it's the didactic, it's the lecture portion that's online. And it's a, uh, the, the students can access it anytime they want. And we interact with them as their, as their coaches, as their teachers, trainers. Um, but the skills that one learns uh, being a mediator is, I think the biggest one is to be neutral or as neutral as you possibly can. And by that, I mean, don't be judgmental. Oftentimes when somebody comes to us and they say something, we already make some sort of a determination about them. And we teach mediators, please don't do that. Wait, hold back, let, hear everything. Because it might not be because we, we make a determination or a judgment and then there's a barrier and we don't listen to what they're saying. And we listen oftentimes to respond. We hear the key word or magic word, and bam, we started fashioning our own retort. And that's the argument. And that's not what this is about. It's about listening to understand. 
And uh, oftentimes it's something that's very simple. We just didn't take the time to appreciate how important it is to the other side. Wow, that, that's very powerful. Um, for, for this particular time, you know, I will go in the global camp meeting. It seems like there's a direct tie between conflict resolution and Christianity. And what I mean by that is if you're saying that this skill, if I went through this, regardless of my background or whatever it is, and I got trained in conflict resolution, restorative mediation, um, the pause and not judging, not judging. And you also said it's very simple. And if we could just learn, that kind of speaks to regardless of me as a sinner, regardless of me as we hear a lot about implicit bias and the, the biases that we have, and we know there's the overt uh, and, and prejudice that you have, and then you have the implicit bias and all those. But if I had this skill, regardless of that, I would. it seems that I would have skills to know how to pause not just listen to respond, but listen so that I can hear what's being said. And then I would be equipped with skills that I could use to, to help navigate whatever scenario I'm in. Um, so with that being said, I, I think that from a Christian standpoint, this is extremely powerful, extremely powerful, because I'm supposed to represent Christ. And that's what Christ did. He had a huge following walking around, interacting with people, regardless of who they were. He listened to them, found out their need and had a practical response. So when I hear something like listen, and it's very simple, that just the word that that comes to mind is Jesus. He listened and his approaches were very simple. So that I thank you for that. Um, Richard, what what does as I talk about Christianity, I shared my little tie in. That's me creating my own segue for you, right? So when you get on this side, you get to control things and, and it makes it easier that way, right? So yep. from your perspective, what does conflict resolution have to do with Christianity? And more importantly, specifically Adventism? Well, I'd really like JR to comment on the training that we've been doing with pastors. Um, Tony's been part of that too, but uh, JR, I think you have a, a particular uh, a view of that uh, and you've seen the significance of this training uh, in pastors here in the United States but especially in the work that we've done in Barbados and in Ireland and I'd really like you to comment on what you think the training has to offer for pastors. Thanks Richard. Yeah it's um, it's been amazing to watch the pastors totally embrace restorative mediation. You know it's it's they they've They've tried through everything else they've done through their training to be wonderful counselors, to be, be religious scholars, to be able to, to work with their congregations. Um, but in many cases, they, they really want to work outside of their church and help the community as much as they want to help the community of their church. Um, and restorative mediation, um, they've just gravitated to it as a way of saying, here are some new skills that we can use, not only within our church, but new skills that I can use into my community to help my community heal, to help my community be a better place. And some of the, th the things we take them through in that get them to really understand themselves more, um, but also to, to take some time to reflect on what they're learning in the work that Tony and I are doing and how that connects to the gospel. So in many cases, they, we, we ask them to you know, cite passages that they think reflect the work that they're doing within the, within the training, within the didactic work. And then we talk about that and they talk about that. And, and um, you know, Petoni and I has been wonderful because it's kind of like an ongoing Bible class for us to, to listen to them and hear them speak about that. And just because they have such skill and such thought, but it's very thoughtful. And, when, what, you, what the pastors come to, to understand from that is that everything they're learning is, is really in the, in, in the gospel as well. And it's directly connected and, and from all kinds of ways. And one of my favorite things that I've learned um, as I've, I've worked through this work is I, I came to realize one day that 
approximately 85% of all of the assumptions that I have are incorrect. Hmm. About 85% of my assumptions are incorrect. And when I came to that realization, first, it once again reminded me that I'm not perfect. Um, but secondly, what it taught me was that before I act on an assumption, I need to test it. And, and when, when we talk about that within our training and people think about that and they think about their assumptions and think about the, the responsibility they have to test an assumption before they, they, they act on it, um, changes the way they relate to people, even though most pastors relate to people in wonderful ways, it changes and, and moves it to another level for them. So I think this is, is highly impactful for pastors and elders and anybody else involved with, within the ministry that, that really wants to have an impact both internally and externally from their congregation. Share, share with the viewers, how does conflict resolution tie in? Well, Adventism is something that uh, has its roots all the way back to uh, a group of um, uh, people from the Reformation called Anabaptists. And there was a big fight, of course, about whether or not infants should be baptized or not. But that Anabaptist tradition uh, was perceived as kind of a anti-government, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the governments had formal religion that was state religion. And so Adventism evolved out of uh, Anabaptism. And, and of course, we have people that are called Baptists today, but a lot of those folks don't really necessarily know their roots and don't understand that, that there's really been a split. There's kind of a split between the Anabaptist line and the Evangelical line. Evangelical line kind of sees government as an ally, as a way of um, implementing uh, uh, solutions in society. And then the Anabaptist line, uh, the folks that really have stayed along that line um, are the Mennonites and uh, other groups that maybe we've heard less of. And it's really interesting that that Anabaptist line has a strong, strong, strong tradition of peacemaking. And uh, also kind of associated with that, maybe uh, you could call the Quakers uh, come into it. And then there's lots of other religious groups that have adopted peacemaking as part of, you know, their uh, community ideology. But Adventism specifically did identify with the idea of peace in its earliest days. And in fact, when the Spanish-American War broke out, the Adventist leadership wrote a letter to the president asking him not to go to war. Hmm. But I don't think our leadership has written any letters asking the president not to go to war since then. I don't, I don't know if we have, but I kind of have a doubt about that. And, and so peacemaking was actually part of our very fiber at the very beginning of this. And you can see peacemaking in who we are when it comes to our healthcare work. Because to be in healthcare is to choose to be unbiased. You choose not to judge how the person got into your emergency room, how the person came to be ill and have lung cancer. You may not like the fact that they smoke. You may not like the fact that they belong to a gang. A gang. But the bottom line is that you have committed yourself to taking care of people regardless of their faith, regardless of their circumstances. You are there to take care of them. And so again, that is foundational to Adventist thinking. So when it comes to Adventism, uh, maybe the one thing that we've really lost is, and I like to frame it this way, and then I'll uh, pass the ball. Adventism um, really likes to talk about the great controversy. What Adventism has forgotten is that the first title of the book, The Great Controversy by Ellen White, one of our church founders, was called The Triumph of God's Love. Mm. And I think that we have focused so much on conflict because maybe it sells and we've forgotten that it, that the whole point of that book is that God's love triumphs. And you got to ask, how does God's love triumph? And he triumphs by turning his enemies into friends. You know, most people uh, in the Christian world preach, you know, hellfire and brimstone. Again, one of the beautiful things of Adventism is that we, we don't teach the doctrine of everlasting burning hell. But we've, we've kind of missed the boat without teaching the fact that God makes friends and that this gospel is a gospel of making friends. It's a gospel of forgiveness. It's a gospel of reconciliation. And it's, it's a, a gospel that has 
absolute, real, momentary, in the moment value for relationships. And, and it, it has the power to resolve the conflicts or the sources of the conflict in the relationship. And so as far as I'm concerned, this is the gospel. This is what Adventism is about. And when you look at all of our beliefs through the lens of conflict resolution, you will be amazed at what you see. Well, wow, thank you for that, Richard. That that is, you know, for our work here at CARES, um, you know, the learning partnership speaks to what this is: partnering with the center, uh, partnering with Four Civility and Jr. and Tony, uh, partnering with other people, uh, Daryl Allen, the Mentorship Institute, because our emphasis right now is really on with the current situation where we're at and the pandemic and mental wellness. This has just been an overall uh, wonderful experience. And I hope people really grab on to the fact that this idea of conflict resolution is not just something for the courthouse. It's, it's not just something to, it is truly a ministry, an outreach ministry um, that we are training people in so that it, it really brings a, a tangible response to a practical need. And I think right now, that's what people are looking for. People are hurting, people are scared, people are confused, and anytime, yes, encouraging words help. Obviously, prayer is our number one go-to. But when we get done with those things, the beauty of this type of training, what I'm hearing, is that it's it's tangible you walk away different when you go in you you're doing things you're a great pastor you're a great elder you're accomplished when you come out you're all those things plus you have practical tools that you can meet and and tangible tools that you can meet and and help people in your community and that's just awesome gentlemen thank you so much for your time i appreciate i know you're all busy um but sharing this, I think, is very important for the World Church to hear about. And I look forward to the, the endeavors that we'll be doing together moving forward. Thank you so much. God bless. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff.